Oops. Okay, the green is up. So thank you for <laughs> the introduction. I'm not going to thank the organizer because I'm one organ of the organizer. <laughs> so let's start just. Uh, the prefrontal cortex, uh, as you know, subserves control processes that guide adaptive behavior in everyday life. And it was shown nicely by Paul Burgess and uh, Tim Chalice. And what is important is that uh, this uh, PFC function has evolved facing the uncertainty of everyday situations. So the world is uncertain, and we got uncertain information about it. And in such a situation, uh, optimal adaptive behavior involves probabilistic inference processes and basically Bayesian inference uh, processes. So Bayesian inference is to have prior belief about uh, the reliability of some option or the relevance of some option in a given situation that you update according to the occurrence of some external events to get some posterior belief. So what is critical in this kind of Bayesian inference is that you need an exhaustive representation of all the possible options and you need also to learn the likelihood of even given the different option. But the key point is to have a, an exhaustive, exhaustive representation of all possible options. And of course, it is a problem in everyday life. Because everyday uh, environments are changing and uh, usually open-ended. That is, the range of uncertain situations then become potentially infinite and the number of possible behavioral strategy is potentially infinite. So Bayesian inference is not uh, the right model in that case, and statistician has developed a, a, a notion, which is the notion of Dirichlet Dirichlet process mixture, which basically is a generalization of Bayesian inference to open-ended situation. So uh, this uh, DPM generalizes Bayesian inference, and it's allow especially to uh, making inference for arbitrating between either creating new behavioral strategies, especially when you face a new situation you never experienced before, versus adjusting all ones. So DPM are, of course, a mathematically well-defined object. But for several reasons, it's very likely biologically implausible. For several reasons, which are interesting to uh, understand. One is that, of course, because you start to create new strategies, inferenced uh, bear upon a repertoire of behavioral strategies that grow indefinitely. Second one, and maybe even more uh, fundamentally, is that DPM process require making offline backward inference. And it's very important in this kind of processes. Why? Because the decision to create a new strategy or not is a binary decision. It's a, a discrete decision or an all or none decision. So it's a non-parametric decision. And the possibility to revise backward every, every time you get new information and the possibility to revise backward your previous decision to create new situation is for this kind of optimal adaptive process a way to reparameterize these uh, all or none decisions. Which means that uh, whenever you get new information, you go back, you travel backward in time and you revise all your past decisions to create new strategies. And because of these two, uh, these two factors, I mean, computational costs grow exponentially with time. So very, it's a very, very costly, computationally costly process. So for this reason, it's probably not biologically plausible. And uh, the question we, uh, I am interested in, and I'm going to focus today, is that uh, which control process 
possibly approximating deep shearing process, have evolved in the PFC for guiding behavior in everyday environments. Another way to formulate the question is this one, is how the PFC arbitrates between staying with and adjusting the current behavioral strategy that drive ongoing behavior, typically through reinforcement learning. You adjust through reinforcement learning, but to learn, you probably get, uh, make some errors. And to learn, you need to perseverate on the same strategy. You need to stay on it. Or, because you make some errors or you get some negative feedback, you may prefer rather to learn or to adjust to switch to another learned strategy uh, stored in long-term memory. Or, if you face a totally new situation, you may prefer to explore and learn new strategy for driving action. So the question is how basically the PFC uh, is equipped to arbitrate between these three general behavioral options. So just to clarify things, that when I use the term behavioral strategy, I consider a, rep a mental representation which contains a mapping that maps stimuli onto actions and a mapping that maps stimulus action pair onto expected outcomes. And ideally, I mean, you have a behavioral strategy that is relevant for every kind of situation you can encounter in your life. But of course, there are some uncertainties. So basically, the uh, environment is more or less in an hidden state. <coughs> and you can learn these internal models. Typically, I mean, the stimulus action mapping you learn through reinforcement learning and the learning uh, of the, uh, this predictive mapping is more based on likelihood. So just a very general framework. So we address the question, this is the big arbitration problem between staying and learning versus switching versus creating new strategy. On the, with the following protocol, a very simple protocol, where we uh, presented subject digits and subject has, in response to every digit, to press a key, uh, a response key. And they get either a positive or negative feedback. So the idea is that subject have to find, through so, uh, trial and errors, which is the right combination between uh, digits and response key. So very simple. Basically, there is no instruction in the task. The, but of course, we enrich the task by provide some noise in the feedback. So sometimes subject select the right response, but they get a, a negative feedback. Or uh, inversely, they select uh, incorrect response and they get a positive feedback. So there are 10% noise in the feedback, which makes the task not so trivial, but still easy, of course. And we introduce this notion that this contingency can change over time in an unpredictable way. After a given number of trials, I mean, digit response combination change, and of course, correct response to stimulus change, and subject where we are not, we are not warned about this change, which makes the task much more complex because when you get a negative feedback, you have to infer whether it's because it's not in the feedback or whether actually there is a change in the combination, in the hidden combination. And the third uh, factor, experimental factor we manipulate is whether subject perform in a recurrent environment, whereas there is only three combinations which reoccur in a pseudo-random order, or in an open environment, which more or less mimic the everyday environment, where basically, I mean, whenever there is a combination change, it change for a new combination. Of course, there could be overlap between combinations, but overall, the combination is always distinct from one you experienced before. And subject, we are not informed about whether they perform in this recurrent session or in this open session. So of course, in this session, when they, uh, when they for example, face this situation, they can, from feedback, infer that actually this uh, feedback or uh, stimulus action feedback contingency resembles to what they experience in, in this episode, 
and then to retrieve the combination or the behavioral strategy to perform more efficiently in this condition, which is something I cannot do here. So in this experiment, the optimal behavior is shown here. This is the behavior obtained from the direct process uh, mixture model. And on the top panel, you have the proportion of correct response that follow a combination change, so an episode onset when a new combination is introduced. And in red, you have the performance of this model in recurrent condition and in green in the open condition. So of course, as expected, the optimal model perform more efficiently or adapt more efficiently to the new episodes in the recurrent than in an open condition because you can retrieve the fact that he already experienced this combination before. Here we have the proportion of what we call exploratory response. That is the number of the proportion of response which are neither correct nor perseverative, that is correct in the previous episodes. And as you see, there is a peak at the, in the earlier, in the first trial in the, in the episode, and then it shrink again because uh, the model then start to find the correct response to each stimuli. And of course, it shrink much faster in the recurrence than in the open condition. And as I said, this optimal model is able from feedback to infer that, oh, I got this feedback from this stimuli, so I infer that this corresponds to the combination I encounter in previous episodes. So he can retrieve these combinations and then he can infer what would be the correct response to the other stimulus because he has the whole combination. And that's why that here in the, and it could be that only in the, rec, in the recurrent condition, not in the open condition, because in the open condition, the condition, every combination is new. And that's why here you have a peak in the mutual dependency between the feedback received in trial T and the response made by, by the model in the next trial. So basically, uh, here, I mean, from feedback received in one trial, you can infer what could be the correct response in the uh, other, uh, in the next trial. So there is a mutual dependency, a big peak at the very beginning, and once the combination is retrieved, then there is no more uh, dependency between response. There are some possibly noise in the system. And of course, in the open condition, it's flat because there is not this retrieval process and this inferential process that allow to infer from the feedback what is the correct combination and from this combination what are all the actions that map onto the stimulus. So this is optimal performance. And here, this is the uh, uh, human performance in this task. So you see that overall, it matched more or less uh, the DPM model, and you, see, you can see that you have also this peak here, that is subject have uh, the characteristic of retrieving combination, inferring the right combination from the feedback, more or less similar to the DPM model, but still, they are better in the recurrence than in the open condition, but still you can see that actually they are highly suboptimal. For example, after 10 trials, Subject perform at 60% uh, correct, whereas the DPM model after D trial perform at about 90% correct. So it's not a surprise. Subjects are suboptimal and they are strongly suboptimal, but still they, they show all the characteristics of this kind of model. So one way to, to model this behavior, very easy way, is that, okay, you take this model, and you add noise, for example, at the selection stage, and you will fit this average performance. But it's very tricky and very weird because you have a very, very costly process, computationally very costly. I mean, the task, I mean, uh, in some trials, this process, especially at the end, need about 10 minutes of, of computation on a computer, high-speed computer. 
so it's totally crazy, I mean, to, uh, to have a very, very sophisticated inflation process and to add noise to modern Z. So the idea is, and so the idea is, okay, what, can, what kind of optimal model can account for this behavior given the computational cost associated with this problematic, this problem of arbitration between staying, switching, and creating? So we propose a, a general computational framework uh, to explain this human performance, which is basically an approximation of DPM process, which obey two computa computability constraints. One is that there is no backward inference. So probabilistic inference operates only uh, online and forward. So you don't revise what you decide in your past, even in your mind according to new information, but to infer from the past what you will do in the present and possibly in the uh, future. And second, that even if you have the ability to create new strategies, inferential processes are limited to a small subset of strategies stored in long-term memory. So this inferential buffer basically reflects the capacity limit of uh, human working memory. And the key feature is that Bayesian inference are combined with a different notion of inference, which is hypothesis testing, to explore new strategy built from long-term memory for possibly updating this inferential buffer. Because as soon as you have a buffer, a limited capacity buffer, you need to decide which strategy belongs to this buffer and which one needs to be discarded. And this is the role of hypothesis testing here in this framework. So computationally, how you uh, combine uh, Bayesian inference and hypothesis testing, remember that in statistics, this is the two main concept of statistics. You have Bayesian inference and you have the inferential statistic about hypothesis testing as are set up on very different assumptions. Here the idea is that Inferential process or Bayesian inference bear upon inferring the absolute reliability of every strategy in the buffer. Whereas this notion of reliability corresponds to the probability that current external contingency match those the strategy has learned. Or equivalently, absolute reliability measures to which extent the hidden cause determining current external contingency match the cause determining the external contingency the strategy has learned. So it's very similar to the notion of the second order notion of confidence that uh, Steve uh, presented uh, in the morning. And uh, so the idea is that you do that, you infer <coughs> this absolute reliability uh, for every strategy in your buffer. But of course, you cannot really infer that. It's computationally impossible because it requires computing the probability that no match may occur with any monitor strategies. You cannot make this right computation exactly because you need to have an exhaustive representation. You need to know what you don't know, basically. But you can have uh, we, we can use an estimate of this using based on the maximum entropy principle. So basically, when you don't know something, you try to make the less assumption about it. So in this framework, it means that you assume that when no match occurs with any monitor strategy, action outcomes you experience with the strategy you are uh, in your buffer are equiprobable. So basically, all over possible hidden causes. Very simple principle, actually. Which means basically, I mean, to be short and not to, uh, and, and to keep uh, everything simple, that in the Bayesian inference process, you need to add the term. So here, lambda represents the reliability of strategy i. And you just only, uh, to, you need just to add a term here, which basically this term represents the probability that no strategy in the buffer apply to trial t plus 1. And basically, here, this is the equiprobability of action outcomes. So 
So this is this notion of absolute reliability. It's named absolute because it takes into account the possibility that actually the strategy you have in the buffer and on which you make the inference actually uh, does not match uh, the current situation. So it's actually you have unknown strategies that you don't know. So how the model works, basically. So the idea is that uh, because it's an absolute notion of reliability, when one strategy in the buffer has a reliability above 0 0.5, it means that in probabilistic term, it, it's more likely match the current situation than doesn't match the current situation. Then this strategy is selected to drive behavior. This is the actor strategy. So this strategy drives behavior. You get some feedback or whatever, and then this strategy learns. This is only strategy which learns from external contingency. And in the buffer, you have some alternative strategies, counterfactual strategy, which make no contribution to the action, but still you keep it in mind in the buffer. And from uh, typically action outcome, you may revise your uh, reliability. And it could be that after a while, one alternative strategy becomes reliable, then it becomes the actor. So you switch. It's a task switching process. Just a comment here. Here, the notion of strategy selection is based on a confidence judgment or the reliability, the notion of reliability, and is not related to a notion of any goal. Here, there is no goal. It's only I try to figure out which is the current situation and whether it's match one situation I have in mind. And of course, in this model, it could happen that none of the strategy in the buffer are reliable. And this is when the model start hypothesis testing. So we, we call this event when it start hypothesis testing, when there is no uh, reliable strategy in the buffer, switching event because it switched into exploration. And basically, the idea here is very simple, that you create a new strategy simply by a, a mixture of strategy in long-term memory. You don't start from nothing, but you remix all the strategies. There is a weighted procedure, but uh, it's not so important here. And you start with probing a new actor built from your long-term memory. And you may initialize it to a, a given parameter. There is a way to compute theoretically this parameter, but here in the model it's a free parameter because it's a key of actually parameter for accounting for inter-individual inter uh, differences. So you start acting with this probe actor. I mean, computationally, you start acting with an unreliable strategy. And that's why it's, we call this period exploration. And then you can quit this exploration period in two different ways. Either the probe actor becomes reliable, because it's learned, of course, and we call that confirmation event. So you confirm your new hypothesized actor strategy. So you confirm it, so it's consolidated in long-term memory. And if your buffer is limited to three strategies, you discard one strategy. Typically, the least recently uh, used one. Or it could be that actually an alternative or a counterfactual strategy in your buffer become reliable while your probe actor still remain unreliable. In that case, you simply discard this actor, you reject, you disband it, it, it is disbanded, and you switch back, you return to uh, a known strategy in your buffer. So this is basically how the model works, and we call this event rejection events. Um, I can skip that. So here you have the model fit on uh, human performance, and you see that this model actually accounts for the behavioral performance on, uh, of human subject in this task. You see here that actually this model, whatever the fitting criterion, make a better fit than alternative models. So, f and for example, here you have an re a pure reinforcement learning model, so with no inferential process. 
here you have the max model, here is a model where it's a very similar model, except that when you create a new strategy, you don't really test it. You create it and you keep it. There is no hypothesis testing. And it fits uh, less uh, well than this uh, model. We call it the probe model. Also here you have the forget model, where this is a model uh, that, um, where you don't create strategy, you have a, a fixed repertoire of strategy, but you forget the strategy you are not using. So you can recycle strategies uh, as new strategy, but they are actually all strategies that were forgotten. And it makes a less good fit. And especially with this model, I, I don't have the slide here, but you cannot account for these three effects at the same time, and especially of this peak here. What is interesting is that the buffer capacity in this model is a free parameter during the fitting, and what we observe is that in, if we fit the model only on the recurrent condition, we found that the uh, buffer capacity is about three strategies. And if we fit only on the open condition, we found that it's also about three strategies. That is that this three is independent of the fact that in the recurrent condition, we use only three uh, combinations. It seems to be more, uh, something more uh, important than only uh, something related to the experimental design. So here's another experiment, which is exactly the same, actually. But now subject performs this task in the scanner. And yes, this is exactly the same performance I show you. And so with the model fitting, so you see that it's replicate what I already uh, show you. And also in terms of uh, here Bayesian model comparison or uh, uh, least square performance, this model fit better than the other model. OK. Looks fine, but there is a big problem here, is that this model I presented to you predicts that there are some switch in performance because you should switch in exploration, create a new, uh, new uh, strategy or new combination, and learn new combination, reject it, or confirm it. So there should be some uh, transition, abrupt transition in the performance, you cannot see here. So probably the reason is that here you smooth or you average model performance across episodes and subject, because the free parameters are not exactly the same across subjects, and it's probably mask this abrupt transition in performance. But this is a model, so we can decide to rely actually model performance on when the model decides to switch into exploration for creating a new task set and to quit exploration either by rejecting the probe actor or confirm it. This is what is shown here. If now we align model performance on when the model decides to switch in according to the reliability inference, you see that now there is an abrupt transition in exploratory response, so very baseline ba exploratory response, then when the model switch into exploration, then you have an abrupt increase of exploratory response and an abrupt decrease of perseverative response. So the model really in turn into exploratory, into this exploration state with a new, <coughs> a new strategies. And again, now if we look at, if we align the model on when it decides to reject the probe actor, which means that in the buffer it could figure out which combination is the right one. In the recurrent condition, you see that there is an abrupt transition of correct response when the model retrieves, which is expected, of course, the correct combination from the buffer. Whereas in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, when there is a confirmation of the actor, so the model start uh, performing with the same strategy, just continue to adjust it, which is a new actor strategy, then there is no abrupt change and only a gradual increase of performance due to learning, to reinforcement learning. Okay. 
Here, this is the subject performance. And just to be fast, you see that actually, when you rely on subject performance on model prediction about events, you see that we observe more or less the same abrupt transition. So the model account for actually subject performance. When uh, the model predicts that there is switching event and uh, uh, confirmation or rejection events. So now the question is to know whether this model is implemented in the brain, whether this is really a model of what happened in the prefrontal cortex. And this model makes basically two, predi uh, two basic predictions. One is that you need, so there are, the buffer is three according to the fitting, so you need the prefrontal cortex needs to monitor the reliability of the ongoing strategy, which drives behavior, plus the reliability of two alternative strategies. And second, you should observe no correlate of this switching event, rejection, and confirmation event. And the nice thing is that we observe actually all this prediction. We observe that in the, median, in the anterior medial prefrontal cortex, with uh, these two regions actually correct with the reliability of the actor strategy, the ongoing strategy which drives behavior, whereas the frontopolar cortex, especially in the right, I mean, monitors simultaneously the uh, reliability of the two alternate strategies in the buffer, <coughs> which are created by the model and so on. Second, uh, we have correlate of switching event when the model decides to go into exploration in the uh, dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which responds to when the model decides to switch in, and no response to the other events, or confirmation rejection, and it's specific to this dorsal, dorsal medial part and not to the ventromedial part of the medial prefrontal cortex. We have correlate of rejection event in the uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, or lateral prefrontal cortex, not really dorsal, and we have correlate of this confirmation event when there is no star switching, just a confirmation in the model that those prop strategies need to be consolidated and kept in the ventral striatum. And this response is very specific at this timing of the model. So really when the model in the trial, when the model switch in, you have this response in the DSEC and not in the preceding or successive model. So just to go to the conclusion, basically this data, I, the sketch I, I show you is that it seems that the PFCC is composed of two inferential tracks. A medial track, which comprises the VMPFC, the DSCC, and the ventral striatum, which is concerned about the ongoing behavioral strategy. And it fits more or less the, the notion of that uh, Paul developed that the medial part is more related to external thought or external event. Here, this is the ongoing behavioral strategy. With the VMPFC inferring the absolute reliability of the ongoing behavioral strategy, the DSCC detecting when it becomes unreliable and trigger exploration, that is, in this model, the creation of new strategy. And finally, the ventral striatum detect when this newly created strategy becomes reliable probably, presumably, for consolidating them in long-term memory and terminating exploration. And a lateral track, which comprise a polar PFC, inferring the absolute reality of, according to, this, to, to the model fitting, at most two alternative behavioral strategies at the same time, two counterfactual strategies. And the lateral PFC here detecting when one of these uh, counterfactual strategies become uh, reliable for retrieving and driving behavior as switching to this actor. And what the model says is that the coupling between the medial and the lateral track relies hypothesis testing bearing upon newly created strategies. And what is interesting is that the polar PFC, the lateral part, seems to be unique to human according to several studies. And here, this region seems to, according to the model, to gently infer multiple possible hidden causes, determining accounting external contingency, 
and consequently to test the formation of new causal or hidden latent state, causal hypothesis about e observed external contingency, and so the creation of new strategy. And what is interesting here is that you have this notion of absolute reliability with this s threshold of 0 0.5, which is uh, very important, and which is equivalent somewhere to, uh, to making some true and false exclusive judgment about whether this strategy is correct or not about hidden cause. And it might account for uh, some feature, at least, of uh, human reasoning abilities. Uh, so I'm seeing I'm run out of time. Thank you very much for your attention.